Hello everyone, I'm Professor McCoy, and today we're going to be reading from and discussing uh, a selection of John Duns Scotus' commentary on Aristotle's metaphysics. It's going to be excerpted from John Duns Scotus, Selected Writings on Ethics, edited and translated by Thomas Williams. Uh, for more discussions on this, I have another video that will be linked in the description below where I discuss some of the issues uh, that this brings up in a little bit more detail. Questions on Aristotle's Metaphysics 9, question 15. Is the distinction Aristotle draws between rational and non-rational powers appropriate? Is the distinction that Aristotle draws between rational and non-rational powers, that powers are powers for opposites, whereas non-rational powers are for one of a pair of opposites appropriate? So I'm going to pause here already. Uh, just to make sure that this distinction is clear enough, uh, what he is, uh, uh, what the distinction Aristotle is making here uh, is between uh, powers for opposites, so powers that can discern between and choose between opposite things. Uh, Aristotle calls these rational powers. Uh, Scotus takes this distinction and runs with it, and he goes in somewhat of his own direction with it in some cases, uh, but I think the distinction is relatively clear. Uh, a non-rational power or a uh, natural power, as both Aristotle and Scotus sometimes refer to it, uh, is one which always acts fully um, for whatever end it is capable of acting towards. Uh, so uh, physical powers are a perfect example of this. For, um, for probably the most prototypical example, we can look to gravity or something like that. Gravity always attracts uh, bodies with mass to one another, uh, and it does not uh, both attract and repel. It does not both uh, attract and attract less. Uh, it always acts fully to the full extent that it is capable of acting. By contrast, a rational power is one which decides and discerns between opposites. So reason is the prototypical rational power in particular for Aristotle. Um, what this means is reason, our intellects, are capable of, of looking at different alternatives and deciding between the two of them. Uh, with this, uh, this distinguishes from non-rational powers because a rational power then, uh, Scotus will emphasize, is a power which is free to then discern between opposites. So back to Scotus's text, let's continue. Arguments that it is not. First, that it is not correct as regards rational powers. Something that has a rational power can do what the power is for. Therefore, it could do opposite acts simultaneously. One might say, just as Aristotle appears to say in the text, that it does not have the power to do opposites at a given time, but rather that it has the power at a given time to do opposites. On the contrary, take the now in which one opposite is present. I ask whether the other can be present in that very same now or not. If it can, the conclusion has been evidently established. There are opposites at the same time. If it can't, it follows that this power in this now is only for one of a pair of opposites. So his objection here, uh, the, or the objection that he is presenting, uh, he has not given his actual position just yet. Uh, this is the standard medieval quadlibital format. Um, he's presenting the potential objection to Aristotle's view that any given rational power is a power for one end, because for it to be a power for opposites, right, if it can do both A and not A, then that means that it is capable of self-contradiction. And self-contradiction in the fully robust sense of violating the law of non-contradiction, right, something cannot be both A and not A in the same respect at the same time, to say that a power is for opposites in this full robust sense, it seems that this would have to mean that it is capable of contradiction at this time in the same way. Scotus pushes back the on the contrary um, by pointing out that no, that is not the case. It is the power to do both A and not A. It is not the activation of A and not A. So we can take this uh, in terms of uh, the earlier scholastic distinction between active, uh, between act and potency. And to say that a power has the, uh, to put it in Aquinas's more technical terms, the second act, uh, the second potentiality. In other words, the power to do both A and to do not A. Uh, 
This does not mean that it has the actuality of A and not A. So this doesn't, uh, at, least, uh, at least as stated, this does not have uh, the contradiction that we are looking at, that we are, uh, that we're concerned about in this objection. So continuing with Scotus's text. Also, second, there is no power that cannot issue in some act. But since this power for opposites can't issue in opposite acts at the same time, it evidently cannot issue any act at all unless it is determined as it's already argued in the text of chapter four of Aristotle's Metaphysics. But having been determined, it is clearly a power for only one of the opposites. Therefore, insofar it is, as it is a power at all, it is evidently a power for only one of the opposites. This is something he's going to expand upon quite a bit more as he goes forward. Uh, and this is the point that uh, this, this objection points out that for a power to have causal efficacy at all, it needs to be determined. It needs to actually act for a certain end and not just have the potential to act for a certain end. Uh, and this is working on the assumption that a natural, that a sorry, a rational power acts more or less like a natural power. It is determined by something outside of itself. Scotus is eventually going to counteract this by arguing that a rational power is self-determining. It is not determined by an antecedent cause. It is the beginning of a new causal series. Uh, this is a fundamental difference that he's going to have to expand upon, but this is the first time that we're uh, in this text that we're going to see this becoming uh, relevant in the objections to Aristotle's view. Uh, so let's continue and see how else uh, Scotus winds up um, interpreting and perhaps even reinterpreting uh, what Aristotle has to say. Also third, it would then follow that the will could will the opposite of the end and could will evil under the aspect of evil, just as it can will their opposites. The consequent is false, because as Aristotle says in 7.4, free men are not allowed to act at random, etc. Against the other part of that division, that is non-rational powers, first, the sun can issue in opposite effects here below, for it melts ice and hardens clay. Nonetheless, the sun's power is non-rational. This is a very specific, uh, a very specific objection, um, and it comes down to the, the 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 difference between the actual power and what it is doing, and the uh, the consequent effects of that power. Uh, I, I did skip over the third one because we're, we're he's going to talk about that extensively, and it'll be better to wait until he gets to it later. So continuing on. Also later in chapter seven, the philosopher claims that every power is a power for contradiction, and he makes it clear that this is true even of active powers. Also, according to Aristotle, a rational power is not said to be a power for opposites per se, but a power for one opposite, a positive feature, habitus per se, and for the other, a privation per accidents. But a non-rational power can be a power for opposites in exactly this way. For example, cold is a per accidens cause of heat, and throwing a ball against a wall is a per accidens cause of its rebounding. Therefore, the distinction Aristotle draws is not appropriate. This is uh, this part is relying on the idea of uh, of the difference between opposites and privatives, uh, or privations. A true opposite um, is something like left and right. Uh, a mere privation is something like hot and cold. Cold is the privation of heat. Uh, it is not the, the opposite in the fullest sense in, in the way that left is the opposite of right. right. Um, so he wants, so this is just the, the distinction he wants to make here. We'll see how he responds to it later. In favor of the affirmative view are the philosopher's words in the text. So he doesn't bother giving a defense here he will wind up explaining his view later on, uh, but he essentially lets uh, lets Aristotle's words uh, stand on their own. Uh, and if you are interested in reading those specifically, uh, I will put a link to the relevant section from Aristotle in the description as well. So let's move on to the next uh, next thing Scotus has to say. Reply to the question. Article one: the distinction as Aristotle drew it. In reply to this question, granting that the distinction is appropriate, we must investigate first uh, 
how it ought to be understood, and second, what its cause is. Uh, so he's going to try and explain Aristotle's own uh, own words in his own way, such that he is making his point. So this is a uh, a tendency in the scholastic period uh, among scholastic philosophers to take the writings of of uh, venerated experts of the past, whether that's the philosopher Aristotle. Um, perhaps even more common is uh, is Peter Lombard's sentences. Uh, and take them and, and use uh, use their writing to say their own sort of thing. Um, I don't want this to come off as disingenuous because I don't think that it is. I think that what is what is going on here uh, is something like uh, uh, taking taking the uh, what someone has to say, what a previous philosopher has to say, and using that as the basis for one's own thought, rather than trying simply to say here is what Aristotle thought. What Scotus is doing here uh, is saying, here is Aristotle's writing, and here is how we ought to interpret that in light of what we know about it and what more we can find out. Right? So he is constructing on Aristotle here rather than simply trying to interpret Aristotle. This becomes a bit of a problem for modern interpreters because we tend to think of those two things as very separate tasks, um, whereas the scholastic mind thought of these as roughly the same thing. Right. Uh, one could not, uh, in this context, one could not interpret a writer, uh, a previous writer, a wise person, without uh, without interpreting them in light of one's own thoughts. Right. We didn't have, uh, in the scholastic period, the same understanding of the history of philosophy that we have today, which is trying to find out very specifically what the, uh, what the historical philosopher thought, independently of whether it's correct or not. Right. We, we didn't have the separation between the uh, the PHH, the history of philosophy, and the PHI, philosophy, which uses historical philosophers, maybe. Um, th there may be more to say about this distinction as well. Um, uh, that would probably be for another time. Um, I don't want to get too off track here, but I do want to emphasize again that what Scotus is doing here, he does not, he certainly does not see as sort of revisionism, like we might think of it. Uh, rather, what he's doing is he's doing a close, careful historical study of Aristotle, but he's bringing his own insights to bear on the issues that Aristotle brought up. So continuing and seeing how, uh, how he does so. One, how the distinction ought to be understood. Regarding the first topic, it is important to know that an active power, whether it is a power for an action or for a terminus that is produced, is a power for X in the following way. So long as its nature remains intact, it cannot be an active power for anything other than X. It has the power for X in its own right. For example, so long as coldness remains coldness, it cannot be an active power for heat or a power that elicits heating, given that it is not an active power for heat in its own right. For whatever circumstances might be with respect to coldness, although something else might contribute something to the being of heat, coldness would never contribute to it. So he's a couple of distinctions here. Uh, the action and the terminus, which is produced, uh, these are distinguished uh, particularly by Scotus, less so by uh, other scholastic philosophers, but it is, I think, an important distinction. Um, the action is the act itself. The terminus is the result of the action. Uh, right, so there are, uh, there are a, a good example of this might be um, your action might be, uh, might be speaking, right? I might be speaking, um, as my action. I might even be explaining what Scotus has to say as my action. However, the terminus, which I hope is to be produced by that action, in other words, the end towards which that action is, is directed, is your, the viewer, your education, your learning about what Scotus has to say. Right. The terminus is produced by the action, but it is not itself the action, right? Me talking, me speaking, me even explaining what Scotus has to say is not the very same thing as you learning about Scotus or even me teaching you about Scotus. You learning about Scotus is the terminus of my action, but there is a conceptual distance between those two things, between the action of me speaking and the terminus of you listening. 
Um, the other examples here, uh, I think, are relatively clear. Uh, coldness, uh, coldness not being the uh, not being in any sense the uh, cause of heating or the cause of heat. Right? Co um, powers uh, or particularly actions do not produce their opposites. Right? Actions in themselves, at least, do not produce their opposites unless, of course, it is an action that is for both opposites. So, continuing on, he says. So an active power is called a power for opposite products, whether contrary or contradictory. Pausing again, contrary and contradictory, again, are, uh, uh, are it's the same distinction I made earlier between uh, something like left and right and something like, uh, uh, something like hot and cold. Continuing, uh, which while remaining one nature has a first terminus under which both opposites equally fall, but an active power is a power for opposite actions which, while remaining one, is sufficient to elicit such, such actions. And if the action of a power that is properly active is called an act in the sense I explained in the reply to the third argument in question four, then every power that is a power for opposite actions is a power for opposite acts, but not vice versa. But you must understand this. A power is for opposite actions, that is, for an action and its negation, in the way that will become evident in the discussion of the second topic. But what I am calling an active power here is not a relation that is counted according to the number of correlatives, but rather the absolute nature of that is, uh, of that is the proper foundation of the multiple relations that are to opposite effects. Okay. This distinction at the end here uh, is critical to his point that a power can be for opposites. Uh, when he says that it is not a relation that is counted according to the number of correlatives, what that means is he's not he's not distinguishing powers based on their uh, based on the various terminuses that they correlate to. Right? Me talking about SCOTUS might produce multiple effects. But that does not mean that the action is multiple actions. Right? This is critical to a lot of ethical issues, uh, particularly the principle of double effect. Um, in other words, that one action can produce multiple effects, uh, but it only has one characteristic end to it. Right? So this is this is uh, this is critical to his ability to say that that an action uh, can be for opposites. Uh, because a single action can have multiple correlative terminuses, right? Uh, it's just that the action can be inclined towards one or inclined towards the other, uh, it, and so the action acts differently one way or another, right? So the power of choice or any kind of rational power, right? The intellect, the will, whatever that might be, is capable of producing opposites. Uh, it is capable of for an action and its negation, as he says. Um, and because it is capable of producing these opposites, one might be tempted to think that, well, that means that it's two separate powers, the power to act in one way and the power to act in the opposite way. But Scotus doesn't want to say that. He wants to say that there is one active power, but it is capable of acting for one way or for its opposite. It is not distinguished into multiple powers or even multiple causes or multiple actions because it produces or is capable of producing different results. Okay, so continuing on uh, to the other half of his uh, discussion of this distinction. Two, the cause of the distinction. Concerning the second topic, Aristotle evidently claims that the cause of the distinction is this. A natural form is only a principle for assimilating to one opposite in terms of natural similarity, as the form is what it is and not the opposite. By contrast, a form in the intellect, for example, knowledge, uh, is a principle for assimilating opposites in terms of intentional similarity, as the form itself is virtually a likeness, similitudo, of opposite objects of cognition. For there is one and the same science of contraries, as there is of privative opposites, since one of two contraries includes the privation of the other. Now an agent is active with respect to that which it can assimilate to itself in accordance with the form by which it acts, 
and it is on that ground, apparently, that Aristotle accounts for the difference under discussion. Okay, that was wildly complicated, so let's give it a shot. Um, he wants to say here, um, or he wants to interpret Aristotle as saying here, uh, that again, I want to emphasize, he doesn't see those two things as fundamentally different like we might, so keeping that in mind. Um, the form of a thing, right? the form of, of something under consideration is what determines the thing to be what it is and not its opposite or not its privation. Right? So the form of a human being makes it a human being and not a slug, not, not a human being, basically. Um, so it, it determines a thing, the form of the thing determines it to be the thing it is and not its opposite or not something else. However, when we cognize the form of something, when we understand what form something takes, when we understand what something is, what we are taking in is not only the form of the thing, but the form of not the thing, or the form of its contrary or its, privit uh, or its privative. So what he's saying here, essentially, or at least part of, uh, at least the, the most significant part of what he's saying here, is that in order to understand what a human being is, we also necessarily have to understand what a human being is not. Right? So when we take in into our intellect the form of something, we also understand its opposite. We understand what its form is not, or to put it another way, the form of what it is not. What this does is it puts our, uh, our cognition uh, into a state where we are uh, we, in order to understand something, we have to, in a sense, understand the surrounding concepts, right? To understand that a human being is a rational animal, we have to understand uh, what an irrational animal would be, right? To get what a human being is, qua rational animal, we have to then understand, well, what's the opposite? What is an irrational animal? What's the, what's the privative opposite? To understand what an animal is, the other part of the definition of human being, well, we have to understand what inanimate matter is. Uh, we have to understand what it would, what the difference is, in other words, between privative opposites. Also, contraries. If we were to understand one contrary, it stands to reason that we have to understand the other contrary. Uh, right? To know what um, to know what left is, we have to understand that the opposite of it is right. Um, now, we may not necessarily understand the, the terminology for all of these things, and we might not explicitly be able to lay them out, all of that, right? He's not saying that. He's not saying that we have to have uh, a kind of uh, Spinozist understanding of literally everything in order to understand everything, but by taking it, what he's saying is by taking in the form of something that sort of comes along with the understanding, at least the implicit understanding, of what makes it that instead of what it isn't, right? So by understanding that human beings are a rational animal, we understand the privative opposite, that it could be an irrational animal. Okay, so this is how the intellect, according to Aristotle, excuse me, uh, the intellect, according to Aristotle, uh, is a is a rational power uh, in that it it not only discerns between and chooses between opposites, but by understanding a thing, it necessarily understands the opposite of the thing. Right? Uh, simply uh, by contrast, if you want to think of it that way. All right, so let's continue. Continuing his reply to the question, uh, continuing Article One, he says, but. There are quite a few arguments against this explanation of the distinction. First, a natural form can be a principle for assimilating virtual opposites, as is evident, evident in the case of the sun. So the case of the sun, as a reminder, is that the sun uh, both uh, dries clay and um, moistens, um, I forget what example he used, but it moistens the skin, right? Uh, or, oh, no, right, it melts ice, right? Creates, uh, makes nice ice wet and makes clay dry. It says this is a principle for assimilating virtual opposites uh, because it is uh, virtual, meaning in the, uh, in 
in the scholastic context and the sort of Latin context, um, the power to produce opposite effects, wetness and dryness in this case. Uh, that is the case, right? The sun, the heat of the heat and light of the sun is capable of producing opposite effects or apparently opposite effects. Uh, however, it is the same mechanism which causes both of those effects. In other words, both, both are contributing heat to the system and that has certain effects on water, right? He knew that then, Aristotle knew that in his day, right? <clears throat> um, so the, uh, the, the virtual opposites uh, is not the opposites in the action, it is merely the opposites in the terminus or in the effect. Right, so continuing on. Second, this explanation evidently means that only intellect or knowledge is a rational power, which is false, as I shall explain below. This is where he gets wildly controversial, but we'll get there eventually. Continuing. He also seems to make this claim more explicitly in chapter four of the metaphysics, where he concludes that a rational power is for opposites. It will do nothing unless it is determined to one or the other. And what determines it, he says, is appetite or prohiresis. So he apparently excludes prohiresis from counting as a rational power in the sense of a power for opposites. Prohiresis here, and I'm, I'm my own commentary just to clarify, prohiresis uh, is usually translated as choice. Um, it is a Greek term uh, and it is kept in the Greek in Scotus's Latin. Uh, and this is why the translator has chosen not to translate it into English. Uh, Prohiresis is usually usually uh, usually translated rendered as choice in English, um, but that is that is a bit imprecise due to modern connotations of the word choice. Um, Prohiresis is more closely associated with appetite in the original Greek from Aristotle. Uh, so we we talk about making a choice. Well, a lot of case, in a lot of cases, what we mean by that is well, we are uh, we are drawn towards one alternative rather than another. We have an appetite for one alternative rather than another. That is uh, that is the uh, the very basic, very uh, Aristotelian, very classical definition of choice. Uh, Prohiresis here. Um, but it is, uh, but Scotus here wants to expand what that means. And he's eventually going to want to include choice or the will uh, as a rational power. And he does want to say that appetite or choice or prohiresis uh, is not only for the one thing which appeals to it, or we have multiple appetites that are drawn to different things. He wants to say, no, no, we have the will, which is capable of inclining towards opposites. All right, so continuing on. This becomes even more explicit through what follows, where he evidently says that a rational power, once it is determined in this way, acts necessarily. Just as a non-rational power acts necessarily by its very nature. Therefore, it seems that the aggregate of the intellect, which he says is a power for opposites, and the appetite that determines it, which, uh, which he acts necessarily, is unqualifiedly not a rational power. Third, the proof that the intellect has to do with contraries is evidently not valid, though the intellect does have to do with privative opposites. For a contrary, even if it does include the privation of the other contrary, does not do so strictly. Rather, it is a positive nature. Thus, there is a proper cognition of its own entity, not a cognition strictly through the other opposite. Indeed, it is cognized only per accidents when it is cognized through the other opposite. So what he means here is, so to go back to the thing that we were talking about on the previous page, um, the, when the intellect cognizes the form of something, we say that it cognizes the opposite. It understands what it, so when, when when we understand what it is to be a human being, we under, so qua rational animal, we understand what irrationality is by contrast. However, he wants to point out here that that is not strictly speaking the cognition of the contrary, but only the privation. Right. So he doesn't want to say that we can, uh, we can understand contrary opposites, something like left and right, 
purely by cognizing one of the two contraries. Only we can understand the lack or the privation of one contrary. So if we understand what right means, that doesn't, that doesn't necessarily mean we understand what left means. It just me means we have to understand that there is an opposite. There is something which is not right. So in this case, it is not strictly speaking the power for opposites, the intellect, at least in this sense, in, in the context of this third argument. Uh, rather, the intellect is, is a power for, uh, for cognizing something or cognizing uh, the thing and what it is not. And by what it is not, we're talking strictly about, or strictly speaking, we're talking about the privation rather than, uh, rather than talking about uh, the, the contrary opposite. Right? So the intellect does not discern or choose, especially not choose, between opposites, right? Option A and option B. Merely it understands A in the context of not A. Not in the context of B, but only in the context of not A. And this is only a power for opposites in a very, very limited sense. Not in the full robust sense that Aristotle would want it to have to call it a rational power. And again, this is where Scotus is getting to be his most controversial here. Because not only is he going to wind up saying that, that the will is a rational power in addition to the intellect, but he's going to go so far as to say that the intellect is not a rational power, but only the will is. All right, uh, that's all we've got time for for this one. Uh, we will pick up here um, when, we, uh, when we next meet. Um, but for now, feel free to comment and uh, on anything, uh, any of the any of my social medias here uh, for discussion of this uh, this topic, anything that we got went through in here. Uh, if you have any thoughts of your own, any questions, any concerns, any agreements, any disagreements, feel free to post those in the comments, and I will be as interactive as I possibly can. Uh, I do want this to be a somewhat interactive reading group. Uh, so, uh, and also if you are on any of my live streams, I will be keeping all of this in mind. So hopefully I will be able to answer and discuss anything that has to do with this then. So, uh, until next time, have a good day. I'm Professor McCoy and I will see you then. Bye-bye.